The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In our previous episode, we did a teardown of the Nintendo Sony PlayStation prototype. We learned a lot about the system and how its specs would have compared to contemporary CD-ROM systems of the early 90s. However, the system doesn't currently function. So what have Dan and Terry been able to get to work on the system? Well, they said they w hooked up a larger power supply to it once and it actually did turn on, but only the Super Nintendo portion worked and then it didn't have sound. Yeah, and also the CD-ROM wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't eject, it wouldn't spin up, there was nothing on the screen. So what we're gonna do in today's episode is try to get this thing working again. We'll look for any bad caps, any bad bodge wires, uh, make sure the power supply is strong enough, put in the proper voltage and see if we can get it working. Yeah, I know I'd like to play it. All right, let's get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. So I, this plug looked really familiar to me, this yellow power plug, and it made me think of the slim Sony PlayStation 1. Father! <laughs> it's more like grandfather. And 7.5 volts. Mmm, what a coincidence. 7.6, ah, close enough. See this uh, thing right there? That's the power regulator, 7805, which means it's gonna take the 7.5 volts and knock it down to five volts. So everything in the system is gonna run off five volts. I knew that I had some power supplies laying around that would work with these older Sony things. So I found this one. This is only 4.5 volts, but it's got a plug that looks like it'll fit. <gasps> Ta-da! I also made me think of this, because that 7.5 volt looks weird, but mm -hmm. Sony uses it a lot. So here's, this is the power supply. This would be for if you had a Sony PS1 with the screen, and you would actually pass this through so it would power both. Oh, cool. So this is gonna give you three amps, so that should be more than enough to run this thing. Cool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hack off this power plug, put it on here, and then we should have the proper thing to power the system up. Sweet. Then we'll move it over to my workbench, we'll power it up, see if we can get something going on it, and then look into fixing these bodges and hopefully getting the CD-ROM working. All right, let's do this thing. Leroy Jenkins. I've got a PlayStation power supply with the proper voltage and a plug that fits into the back of the prototype. I'm gonna wire it up nicely so it'll look good at shows and also quadruple check the polarity so we don't destroy anything. According to Dan, they've turned it on in this state before with the CD-ROM detached, and it works with the larger power supply. All right, 7.5 volt power supply in. Japanese Street Fighter II. All right, you ready? Hey, there we go. Street Fighter II Turbo. Oh, wow. Yay! Dun, dun. Haruken, you go flame! All right, so we got a Japanese Super Famicom game to work. Let's try Castlevania 4 American version. Also, this game is getting really expensive. God. I think my Nintendo collection is doing better than my investment accounts these days. Oh yeah, there we go, Konami logo. All right, so now we're gonna try a Super FX chip. So this is technically Stunt Race FX, but I swapped out the ROM to turn it into Star Fox 2. So it's a bootleg of an unreleased game on an unreleased console. <laughs> this may open a wormhole. Cool. Yeah, it also runs uh, SFX chips on the SFX. Okay, we played American Super Nintendo games on this, so that's cool. There's no region lock. The main thing stopping you from playing American games on it is the shape of the cartridge slot. So what I want to do next is disconnect one of the bodge wires on the back and see if it stops working. Pretty sure those bodge wires were put there in order to make it work, but you know, I just want to run through every possibility. There's a lot of flux on the underside of this board, meaning they rewired a lot of things. I mean, the case looks like it's ready for production, but the board isn't. There's a lot of mistakes on it. So I'm gonna disconnect a bodge wire and see if that causes the system not to run. I mean, it's entirely possible that they just forgot to run a trace. Well, there it is. I removed a wire from the one-of-a-kind prototype. 
All right, let's see if it works with that one bodge wire removed, and it still does. All right, well, you know what? The bodge wires are probably there for a reason. I'm going to redo them and make them nice because they're a little sloppy. I also wanna make damn sure everything is unhooked and disconnected whenever, whenever I solder. And I suppose we're gonna have people in the comments section saying, oh my God, you're not using an anti-static pad. Believe me, with the humidity in here, we do not have to worry about static on a day like today. Some of the bodges on the circuit board were a little iffy, so I'm going through and replacing all of the wires and redoing the bodges, and then placing down bits of tape to hold everything flat so it can't accidentally get ripped up in the future if they take this apart and photograph it. So this uh, octal transceiver here, um, they're gonna have resistors or something on it, but they've jumpered them all. And some of the jumper wires look a little sketchy, so I was replacing them, but it's kind of tough to do. So I was thinking, hey, why don't I just put in some zero ohm resistors, which are basically just jumper resistors. Um, yeah, these are a little bit bigger than they're supposed to be, but I can at least give it a shot. But if they don't work, then I'll just go back to using wires. So I'm glad Felix ordered some zero ohm resistors. He obviously could see the future. He's like, I can predict that Ben will need this. Okay, I've gone through and replaced all of the mod wires on the bottom side of the SFX. There were a few kind of sketchy connections. I mean, they were technically connected, but not really properly connected, including this tombstone resistor. So I've gone through, replaced the wires. I've used little bits of black masking tape just to hold everything down so the wires won't get accidentally ripped up in the future, just to keep everything nice and flat. And then right here, there was something very, very close to a short circuit. Probably not a short circuit. I mean, it didn't test as one, but I still made sure I replaced it. So yeah, all new mod wires. I'm just gonna go through, make sure everything else is okay. There's a few pins on this work ram that look a little sketchy, although if the work ram didn't work, the Super Nintendo part wouldn't have worked. So I'm just gonna look this over a little bit more and then we'll flip it over and try to do something with the CD-ROM drive. All right, let's see what happens with the CD-ROM attached. No CD-ROM system. Okay, so it's not able to talk to it. X and A, you said? Self-check. Okay, the one on the bottom is sound source check. Basic functions is what the top one means. So this is sound source check. All right, let's see. There's something, something RAM, backup RAM, CD-ROM decoder, no good, CD player IF, no good, and then something, something RAM, no good. Extension RAM is no good. So that's what the second menu means. I wonder what the extension RAM is. <sighs> That'll fix it. The uh, contacts on the cartridge were fairly dirty. I'm wondering if that was causing some of the sporadic extended RAM errors. So I'm gonna run the self-test again. It looks like it, you know, whether or not the CD-ROM's even attached, it still fails in the same way. So whatever is causing the CD-ROM not to work or not even respond is pretty catastrophic. Let's see what it gives us for extension RAM. So it's 256K of extension RAM in the cartridge. Okay, that checked out. Okay, extension RAM and cartridge, okay. Backup RAM also in the cartridge, okay. And the two CD-ROM functions were no-go. Hmm, okay. I think what I wanna do next is run the self-test again and see if we can at least get pulses, like if it's trying to communicate with the CD-ROM. There's another possibility, like you said the sound doesn't work, right? So m maybe a theory, these chips, the chips that also control the CD-ROM might also be involved with the sound generation. So if they don't work for the CD-ROM, they also don't generate sound. I mean, the place, actually, well, the PlayStation 1 was like that. There was three main chips in it. There's a CPU, sound chip, and a uh, video chip. And the sound chip generated the audio, obviously, and also controlled the CD-ROM. So they were linked. So this one, this CXP1100Q, copyright Sony, the Nintendo 1989. Actually, both of these are. So it seems like these would predate the CD-ROM system. So I'm just kind of wondering if those are the same chips that would be on the Super Nintendo or very close. Well, actually, we can see the two connections to the CD-ROM here and here. So the side cable goes here, and what I assume is the main data cable goes here. So that might give us a clue. If you look carefully, these two chips have different pitches for the pins, as do the ones on the Super Nintendo. So there's a SDSP, and that's actually the thing that makes a sound. And then the other one is actually a small coprocessor that drives the sound. So it's not too much different than what the Sega Genesis has. Uh, so these aren't labeled as well, but by looking at the pin counts, we can figure out which one they are. So the one that ends with 80, that is the Sony sound chip. And the one that ends with 64, is the Sony Mini CPU. So we're looking at the Super Nintendo schematic. We can look at 43 and 44, which is going to be the digital audio stream that goes to the digital to analog converter. 
So we can try to figure out why there's an audio on this by actually trying to sniff the audio connection off of these two chips. All right, so we're looking for 4344 on the big chip. So 41, 42, 43. Now we're definitely getting a signal here. All right, so that's the clock because it's constant. So let's hook up another probe and see if we can get the data. So one of the problems the system has is there's no audio coming out of it. I want to know why. There is the audio data. So it's definitely making some sort of noise. So the chip creates the data digitally, sends it to an ADC, and the ADC turns it into analog, analog music. I almost said analog audio. Yeah, you can see it there. See how the blue one is changing? So that is, we can actually take a look. There's a freeze frame of it. Freeze frame. See, that's the audio streaming out of the chip. Okay, so that means the problem with the audio is somewhere further down the line. Now it's time for some shop talk. Karen, do you remember a while back when I made those really cool ZX Spectrum portables? Oh yeah, they came out really well. Oh, thanks. I have a passion for 8-bit computers from the 80s because that's what I grew up on. Now here in America, the ZX Spectrum wasn't really a thing, but it was very popular back in England. So when we end up with projects like that, we don't really have space to keep them all around the shop, so we like to give them away. So this time, you have a chance to win our ZX Spectrum or ZX Spectrum. So go to the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS for your chance to win. Yeah, and I actually built two of them this time, so two people have a chance to get one. Good luck. I found a few more data sheets online. This uh, CXD 25,000AQ is actually a known part. It is a, wait for it, CD digital signal processor. So that's good. I'm still not sure what this 1800Q does, but there are active signals going to it. Whereas this one, I'm not really getting any active signals off of it. I did find in the menu, there's this communication. And if you hit the shoulder buttons, you can see uh, like stop. So this must be a command to tell the CD player to stop. Then it says serve and receive. And yeah, when I push the button, it lights up one of the characters, but then receive doesn't get anything. So it's almost like it's trying to send a command to the CD-ROM, but it's not getting anything back. So what I think I should try to do is figure out where this data is being sent and basically how the data is coming back to it. And maybe I can figure out why it's not getting communication. So receive is uh, four Fs uh, hex. So that probably means the receive line is being pulled high or has a pull up, which makes sense since there's no CD-ROM connected. However, maybe if I can find the pin that actually will pull that low, which would change receive to all zeros, that would at least tell me I'm in the right direction. So Dan had this theory that I thought was really outrageous, and that was whoever had this thing for all these years, it had been disabled for them, you know, so they could keep it. I guess like if you want to put a tank in a park, obviously you take out the guns, that kind of thing. And I thought that was ridiculous. I didn't think anyone would actually do a mod just to make something not work, but I disconnected this wire and put the resistor back down where it was, and now it does do something slightly different on boot not defined, it's doing something different, see that? Before it said CD system not present. Let's see what self-check does. I wonder if the mod was to make it work as a Super Nintendo, since there was probably never any software for the CD-ROM system anyway. Okay, so, well, obviously CD-ROM is, is, mi is missing, so let's do this. Let's see if it acts like a Super Nintendo still. Okay, it still does, huh. All right, well, let's stick the CD-ROM back on. What's that? It's trying to move. Yeah. It's got some sort of power glitch though. See how it's affecting the screen every time it moves? Yeah. It's having some sort of power it. spike. So it's trying to it's trying to move the head to the center to home it, but it's not moving very fast. I did not think God, that is just but that is bizarre. I thought I'd saw everything. You know what else we could do? We could start it with it open and see if it auto closes. Yeah. Most th most things do. See what happens this time. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. The main drive is still having trouble homing. I mean, that was pretty herky-jerky too, yeah. as you saw. Well, as, I, as I, I would like to say, you know, it's not on fire. <laughs> <laughs> we may still get fails on the CD-ROM thing, so. Uh, oh, look at that. Man, Only one thing failed this time. 
We discovered that this mod wire, which is attached to the CD controller, actually disabling the CD controller. My theory is that uh, the CD-ROM wasn't working quite right, so they disabled it. It's better for just to not do anything than to sit there and go chug, 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 which is what happens when it's on. So what they had done, they would tombstoned this 100 ohm resistor and removed it from this pad and connected it to this wire here. As far as the other mods, um, this one here, I mean, this is clearly because the transceiver didn't fit the package laid out on the board. So this, this isn't a disable mod. This is more just they didn't design it right. Same thing with this wire here. Uh, this wire, uh, not exactly sure what it's accomplishing. And over here in this case, it looks like they were supposed to connect something to the cartridge slot and they forgot. So they attached this wire from the RAM to the CPU to the cartridge slot. If you look on the Super Nintendo schematics, this is a, a sys clock, I think it's called, or sys check. Well, anyway, this line is supposed to be connected to all three of these things, but when you remove this wire, there was no connection. So they probably just forgot it in the trace. You know, that happens. That's why you make another board. I noticed some black gunk coming out of a few of these capacitors over here by the secondary regulator. So I desoldered one of the capacitors and it does not smell good. It actually smells a lot like the Atari landfill cartridge that we fixed. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if these bad caps could be affecting some of the power rails. I mean, maybe the secondary power supply is being used for the CD-ROM and oh, I don't know, I'm just postulating really. I can't really use my hot air gun on this because I don't want to like make a whole bunch of components move around. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to clean it up because it was pretty gunky and then put on a capacitor that is not 20 years old. So if you have old electronics and they don't work, uh, capacitors, electrolytic capacitors, always the first thing you should check. Also, uh, before I button this back up, I'm gonna go through and just uh, clean up any flux well, at least the flux that I made. There's a lot of these things were hand soldered, like the cartridge slot has flux on it, which means it was hand soldered at some point. I'm not gonna clean that because I didn't make that mess. <laughs> yeah, great attitude, right? Capacitor's a little taller. Let's make sure it still fits with this metal case. It still fits. Um, yesterday we had the, uh, we're looking at this with the Seek thermal camera and this area was pretty toasty. Maybe better caps will stabilize it. I mean, it couldn't hurt. So I'm gonna replace this one and this one because all three of them were a little leaky and then we'll see if it makes any difference. I don't wanna use a heat gun on these capacitors because I can't risk moving things on this one of a kind board. So I heat up each cap from the side and pull it off slowly. Then I attach new surface mount capacitors in their place. Let's test the CD-ROM again with the caps replaced. Make sure everything's on, all right. Oh, look at that, it's spinning up an audio disc. Still says no disc though. But yeah, look, it actually functions correctly. Oh, and the LCD is on. So the moral of the story is always look for bad caps. If you have an old piece of electronics where something doesn't work, bad electrolytic caps are a likely culprit. Let's try the self-test again. All right, everything's checking out okay. Sound source check, that's what that means. Extension RAM in here. That one failed a couple of times. Let's see if it works today. But the ones we're looking for are the CD-ROM. Hey, there we go, everything's good, yay. We don't have a game disc for this. Uh, Terry thinks he might have one in the attic or like in a box of stuff. That would be killer because you could actually get it to do something. Cause right now it's like no disc. Um, the controls here don't seem to be responding. See, these would just probably, you know, play a CD while you're playing your Super Nintendo game. Oh, repeat mode turned on. That's, oh, that's cool, look at the mode. Oh, also we noticed the audio has been repaired as well. And I wonder if, now the regulator's still warm, but at least the caps are good. So yeah, those caps appear to have fixed the CD-ROM and the sound. Dan put the unit back together. We reclaimed Karen's Weezer CD from it so it doesn't get taken on an adventure. And now we're gonna play some Street Fighter II apparently. Oh yes. And we actually have it hooked up to the screen with S-Video, which will make the picture a little better. So yeah, shall we have a Street Fighter match on the rarest console ever, I guess? Sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, nice. Oh, God, that was horrible. Good thing it's two out of three. <laughs> oh, come on, come on, come on, no, no, no. 
<laughs> oh, come on, man. <laughs> I'm done. I'm going back to college. I play Street Fighter a lot. <laughs> hey, Felix, you want to play? Oh, 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 it's going to be close. Oh, I had like one pixel of life. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, it was a trick. Uh oh, I'm almost dead. Oh. Round three. You know how everyone complains about the price of video games? It's like back in 92, Street Fighter was like a $70 game on the Super Nintendo, yeah. Which would be like $125 now. Oh, I got, what? I got zap kicked. Oh, oh I cannot beat Felix's zap. Oh, 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 oh. What? What? No way! <laughs> there's, there's another round. <laughs> Gosh, that's pretty rare. I hate your zap, Felix. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start by saying, Ben, you are the man. Um, it's a miracle. Ben Hack has managed to restore the video signal. And then uh, he actually got the uh, CD part of it to open and close in the tray, even though it's still showing no CD. But hopefully we're hoping some engineer out there can figure out and help us out to get that part started too. We have sound coming out now, which is amazing. We know so much more now than we did before we came here, and it's, it's great. It's great. Well, Karen, we did it. We got the Nintendo Sony PlayStation prototype to work again. High five. Yeah. So the major problem it had was, drum roll, brrr, bad capacitors. Mm. So any old piece of electronics that sits around for decades, especially if it's in a hot attic like this thing was apparently, your caps can go bad. So if you don't know what's wrong with something, check the capacitors. If they're bloated, if there's black gunk leaking out of them like these had, that's probably a problem because once we did that, the CD-ROM started working again. So again, a special thanks to Dan and Terry for letting us crack open their Nintendo PlayStation. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. This is definitely the most rare device I have ever opened up and examined by a long shot. I'm glad that they let us do it. Yep, so if you have any questions, let us know on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. Where you can also read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Why? These are going in the garbage. Okay. Yeah, this is easy. terrible. No, they're good. There's Jesus Christ on a cracker. Trade in your super rare SFX console for $20 in store credit. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.